Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Gage. Gage is a free and open source test automation tool by ThoughtWorks with a goal of taking the pain out of test automation for acceptance tests. To help with this, Gage supports specifications and markdown, which are easy to read and easy to write. Reusable specifications to simplify your code, which makes refactoring easier and less code means less time maintaining your code. And finally, integrations. Use Gage with your favorite tools and IDEs in the ecosystem of your choice, like Selenium and Sahi Pro, CI and CD tools like GoCD, Jenkins, Travis, and IDE support for Visual Studio, VS Code, IntelliJ, and more. The team behind Gage believes in using web technology to test web applications. Head to gage.org slash jsparty to learn more and give it a try. Once again, gage.org slash jsparty. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the JS Party. Today, we are here to talk about everybody's favorite topic, uh, bugs, not the creepy crawlies, the bugs that you find in your code. Uh, and joining us today on this conversation is I, Sophia, rhymes with mafia. Uh, we've got Kevin Hayball with us, uh, Suze Hinton, and Nick Nisi. I like your rhymes with mafia idea. Like that's a, that's a good way to get it across. I'm trying to think what I could do. <laughs> K-ball oh. rhymes with ball. <laughs> <laughs> There is a whole host of words you can use. Ball, small, mall, call. I'm not as fortunate. <laughs> I, before I got into tech, I uh, I actually did some substitute teaching. And I remember going into a kindergarten classroom and being like, I am Mr. ball, like a bouncing ball. And that worked for communicating to five-year-olds. Like, call yourself a <laughs> basketball and they're good. <laughs> Noted. That's a useful life tip uh, for interacting with children. <laughs> so... Today's conversation is we're just going to talk about software bugs, uh, specifically in JavaScript. Um, and I kind of wanted to kick it off with a reference to an article that was published earlier this year in January. Uh, it was published by Rollbar. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Rollbar is essentially sort of like an error monitoring service. Uh, so you can hook it up and capture any exceptions that occur in your application um, and get stats on them. And they published this really interesting article called The Top 10 JavaScript Errors from 1,000 Projects and How to Avoid Them. And I thought it'd be a really good way to start the conversation on some of the common bugs that we find in our JavaScript code and how folks on the panel uh, fix those bugs or uh, get around them, prevent them from existing in the first place. So one of the first ones that they laid out is our favorite bug ever. It's the uncaught type error can't read property. Um, I just had like a chill go down my spine when I read that. <laughs> um, and essentially, this is a specific variant of an error that occurs when you try to either uh, fetch a property um, or invoke a method on an object that is undefined. You get this error thrown at your face. If you think about it, um, I've got this list of the type five errors. Most of them relate to things being undefined or null when we don't expect them to be. Um, so, you know, how do you all deal with those kinds of bugs in your code handling uh, null cases and undefined cases? I feel like Nick is going to have the, the like mic dropping answer here. <laughs> yeah, Ooh. I could see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Just use TypeScript. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at these five bugs, right? And it's uncut type error, cannot read. Type error, undefined. Type error, null. Type error, mm -hmm. undefined. It's not a function. Mm -hmm. Like, there, there's a common thread here, uh, and it has to do with type. Mm. And what's interesting is that that list is, these are literally the most common ones that happen. And so 
by being able to shield yourself against all of these specific type errors, you're actually knocking down some of the most common things you go to find in your app, which is fascinating. And I'm really glad that this list was shared because it really does kind of call out that we do have an issue with this in JavaScript for sure. Yeah. And for those who don't have a chance to read the list right now, it's essentially all of the different variants of the undefined error that you might find in different browsers, which is something that's knowing each browser has a different way of telling you that you're running into the same bug. I think we need a working group on that. Um, <laughs> that's actually cool. I hadn't I hadn't quite put that together, but you're totally right. Like those are the same exact thing. Yeah, so Chrome will alert you of the same bug using a different message than Firefox or Internet Explorer will, but it's all the same thing in the end. There's a talk by Brittany Storrs. Um, she gave this talk earlier this year. I've been to so many conferences this year, I'm embarrassed to say I forget which one. I think it was JSConf AU. And Brittany has been a teacher at um, a coding school before, and she proposed that we need to have better errors in our browsers and also just like in um, any of our JavaScript engines like Node.js, for example, because sometimes even people who are new, um, this is going to be really, really confusing to them to see that, uh, you know, even different browsers spit out a slightly different error. Um, and it's really, really hard to debug those things when you're really new. And so I would definitely highly encourage people to watch that talk of hers. We'll drop a link in the show notes for that. But I don't, I'm interested if anyone else has kind of seen any proposals to improve the errors that come out of just the JavaScript in general, because other languages are sometimes a little better at this. That's a really good point. And I, I notice, you know, I, I work with some folks who are a little bit more new to JavaScript or junior. And a lot of times they'll come and say, hey, I've got this stack trace. I have no idea what it means. And being able to point and say, oh, you know, that says type error, cannot read property undefined of something that is null. Well, let's go look for what's null, <laughs> you know, but they <laughs> see this massive stack trace and these fairly obscure, I won't say they're obscure because you can understand them when you really dig in, but kind of pattern recognition style error messages rather than something that you get out of like Rust. Rust is, the Rust compiler is phenomenal for pointing you like, what are you probably doing wrong that's resulting in this? Exactly. And I just looked it up and the the talk is called um, A Year of Others Bugs, The Sad State of Error Handling. And she does actually call out other languages that are more helpful, such as Rust or even just Elm, which is technically still transpiling to JavaScript and how they do much mm. better error handling, at least for just trying to help people out. Yeah, I don't do a lot of work with Rust, but I do do work with Elm. And it's got some great error messages when you're trying to get all your types in order and, and everything in line. Something that, as discussed, unfortunately, we don't have in the JavaScript world. <laughs> and I think that a big part of that might just be discrepancies in all the different JavaScript engines that we have running around in different browsers. So coming to, back to prevention, um, you have Nick's easy, in some ways, answer, um, though I'm ashamed to admit I still am not on TypeScript at all. Mm. Uh, you know, there are pure JavaScript solutions as well that help you do some amount of type checking. Um, for example, you could be using something like Flow, uh, which lets you embed type checking straight into vanilla JavaScript. Do you have experience using Flow in a code base that you want to share? Um, a little bit. Um, so it, it definitely highlights, or my experience there definitely highlights both the positive and negative pieces of types, um, you know, types, types one, let you communicate really clearly about what data structure looks like and to let you, you know, catch a lot of these bugs ahead of time. Uh, there are scenarios where they can be extremely painful as well. Anytime you're doing any sort of like meta programming or where you have, um, kind of objects that are coming back in different ways based on on criteria. Uh, I mean, maybe this is my lack of skill with types, but I found it, I often found myself fighting the type checker or compiler to get it to express something where it was like, okay, this thing has two different modes that it can be in um, and you could get it, but then you, it, it was often painful to get it to work right. I don't know, Nick, is that something that just goes away as you get better with it? Mm, it's, yeah, maybe. You, you just get more experience with how to to handle that. And when you see those problems, how to, to better handle it, I think, uh, as you go. Um, 
I was also going to say that you don't have to fully switch to TypeScript to get benefits from it. Uh, the big benefit is the tooling that it provides. And t the TypeScript um, language service can actually infer a lot about your code, about your JavaScript code, without having to switch fully to TypeScript. And in fact, that's what um, Visual Studio Code does for you automatically. Does anyone have non-technical, maybe engineering or best practice solutions that you've implemented in your team for catching these common bugs? I don't know if I'd say for catching them, for but for debugging, one of the things mm, that yeah. I constantly come back to is uh, making sure that you are very explicit about the assumptions you're making. Um, you know, I'm coming into this function and I believe these things are going to be true and then validating that those things are actually true. Because um, I find a lot of times where these bugs come from is we assume something, but then we, we kind of forget that we've made that as an assumption and just take it for granted and mm -hmm. move on. And then where that bites us is when that assumption turns out to not be true in all cases. Maybe it's true in most cases, but then when we hit this bug, it's actually not true because it's coming from a different thing. And if we uh, don't reassess the fact that that was an assumption and, and check it, it can be baffling to try to figure out why is this breaking? How could it possibly be breaking? Um, and so stepping back and saying, okay, what are, what are all of my assumptions and how do I validate them one by one? I find that a code review comes in really handy for this too, because a lot of the time the people looking at what you've just written haven't been staring at the same code for as much time as you have. And so have probably some of less assumptions about what's being passed in and what the shape of it is and things like that. Yeah, and then also codifying that in uh, a unit test to try and capture all of the valid um, inputs that might occur. And if you discover something new as you're running the code, um, instead of just fixing it, try and add a, a unit test to that to make sure to capture for that in the future. Yeah, I thought of tests too, and I thought that maybe test-driven development, if you wanted to get super, super nitty-gritty, highly detailed, you could be writing little mini tests for that, at which point you would almost start justifying something like Flow or TypeScript anyway, because no one really wants to actually re-implement that just for their specific code. But if you didn't want to use something like TypeScript or Flow, you could perhaps write some guardrails during your TDD session to ensure that you're not constantly changing the shape of something in order to get an undefined error happening. One of the skills or lessons that I learned actually a really long time ago from my high school computer science teacher out of all things was that whenever you write a test case for a function, make sure you're always testing the empty or undefined case. Um, mm. And that prevents you from shooting your foot in most situations. Totally. And you should almost um, you should almost test that your code even does that in the first place. You should test to make sure it does break in that way before you then like write something to stop it breaking in that way too. And then that helps with not making a set of assumptions on top of that as well. So I'm curious to explore. Uh, so you uh, saw it, if you had put a set of five top functions here, and as we called out, like four of them are type error related and null and undefined and whatever. But then we have this unknown script error. Uh, that one, I, I've seen it. I don't know any magic for it. Does anybody know any magic for debugging what the heck is going on when that happens? I just saw this last week. Oh, do tell. <laughs> so it was actually in the context of a, um, a unit test that was being kicked off uh, over the WebDriver protocol, which was bringing up um, Electron and running in Electron. And I just kept getting this script error over and over and over and trying to understand what that was. And it was, um, for for our case, it just ended up being that, like the way that we were kicking those those tests off in Electron uh, and they were trying to make, I think, it, I think it was that they were trying to make requests out to, um, like, like in a browsery way, uh, to a, a, a server that wasn't part of its domain. And so it didn't, uh, like it was like a cores error, almost like, I think that's what it was at least. But that is a tough one because it's it gives you no information. Anyone else? No unknown script error? I feel like it this, that's the the JavaScript equivalent of throwing your hands up in the air and saying, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got me. <laughs> yeah, that's when you start looking at everything line by line and it is just so painful. So in this uh real bar blog post, there are two kind of fixes. To get the real error messages, um, it recommends doing the following, which is setting an access control allow origin header on your uh, web server, whether it's like Apache or Nginx or what have you. 
And then there's also setting the cross origin attribute to anonymous on the script tag um, as two techniques for getting the full error message to be able to like debug more effectively. Oh, so basically that unknown script error is, well, we probably know, but we're not allowed to tell you <laughs> because of cross origin <laughs> stuff. <laughs> we're just, we're just trying to give you a hard time. Like something went wrong, but it went wrong someplace that you're not allowed to see. So we're just going to tell you, hey, you know, this went wrong. Um, good luck. Yeah. So um, as was mentioned earlier, it usually happens in sort of like a cross domain context where um, you're like trying to send a message or something. And instead of the external domain or whatever external thing you're accessing, sending you a stack trace with potentially useful information and you know, being kind of like a security loophole, it just says there's a script error, but we're not going to tell you what it is because you might mm. be a bad person. And that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Like that's kind of how guardrails are set up in APIs too, right? You don't just get, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't return things like 404s or, or any kind of clue that yes, you were almost there, but you didn't authenticate properly or something like that. Um, and I know that that sometimes is very frustrating too, when you're trying to debug being a legitimate API user, because like they do have things in there to stop people from being able to exploit their way in one little tiny breadcrumb at a time of clues. But yeah, I, I didn't actually think of just setting the cross origin headers in order to alleviate that. That's actually something that I learned today. Hurrah. Yay for learning. I was actually going to uh, bring up a, a an error message that we used to get, but we really don't get it anymore and see if y'all remember that. Uh, it's unexpected identifier string or number code zero. Does anybody remember yes, that? Yes, I, I have do. to do that. It's been a while. There, you know that, that one, meme where... Sorry. Sorry, I was trying to make a relevant reference and be funny, but I totally fell on my face because I'm a great <laughs> MC. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that one, this error used to cause me so much pain in the past because... Uh, I would only ever see it really in Internet Explorer. Uh, and when, yes, when I tell you exactly. what caused it, I'll tell you, you'll know why. But you try and bring it up in like Firefox or, or Chrome back in the day and it wouldn't it, it, like the code would run fine. So you'd see this. And of course, Internet Explorer never gave you a correct line number or anything. And so it, and this always like would cause me like a half hour of grief until I remembered, oh, yeah, this is actually caused by trailing commas. Mm hmm. Wow. But that error message just gave you nothing. <laughs> Well, it is actually, it's a really interesting highlight of how much linters have kind of reduced the set of errors that often show up because there's whole classes of bugs that used to be essentially runtime bugs that linters just catch and they clean up for you and you don't have to ever worry about it, which is linting is kind of like a half step to the level of validation that you get in something like TypeScript, but it, it gets you a lot. It's very true, but also, uh, thankfully, our JavaScript engines are a little bit more closely aligned in being spec compliant. Now, there's obviously still differences between them, but it's definitely not as bad as it was back in the day. I think even just in a previous episode, I was talking about how, you know, one one browser was using like, um, you know, ECMAScript uh, three, and then the others were on ECMAScript five, for example, and that was just that was sort of the era at which you saw those kind of errors as well, I believe. And so things have gotten a lot better since then, which is really really nice. And I totally agree with the linting thing too; it just stops completely unnecessary like errors. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break and then come back for a really interesting segment. We're gonna get out on the porch, sit on the rocking chairs, and talk about the hardest bugs that we've had to debug in JavaScript. And that is right after the break. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Rollbar. How important is it for you to catch errors before your users do? What if you could resolve those errors in minutes and then deploy with confidence? That's exactly what Rollbar enables for software teams. One of the most frustrating things we all deal with is errors. Most teams either A, rely on their users to report errors, or B, use log files and lists of errors to debug problems. That's such a waste of time. Instantly know what's broken and why, 
with Rollbar. Reduce time wasted debugging and automatically capture errors alongside rich diagnostic data to help you defeat impactful errors. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow. It integrates with your source code repository and deployment system to give you deep insights into exactly what changes caused each error. Give Rollbar a try today at no cost to you. No credit card is required. Our listeners get access to the Bootstrap plan with 100,000 events for free for 90 days. To get started, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. I'm Tim Smith, and my show Away From Keyboard explores the human side of creative work. You'll hear stories sometimes deeply personal about the triumphs and struggles of doing what you love. Jumping off into the abyss is kind of my skill. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so I'm not saying that it's not scary. I'm saying that perhaps my skill is just not being able to estimate how scary it will be. <laughs> New episodes premiere every other Wednesday. Find the show at changelog.com slash AFK or wherever you listen to podcasts. We are back live here to answer and share stories about a really interesting question, which is what is the hardest bug you've had to debug in JavaScript? Uh, so what I want to hear about is, you know, what made that bug hard to debug? Um, how'd you end up solving it or fixing it? And then what did you capture about the debugging process or what did you learn uh, that you took on with you that you can share with us today? Uh, so anyone want to start off with their own harrowing story of facing a very hard to fix bug? I can go with mine. Um, so recently, I, I don't know about hardest of all time because it, you know, the memories fade, pain goes away. <laughs> <laughs> We're not good at remembering pain. Uh, <laughs> just block it out. <laughs> I know it just, it gets totally blocked, but this one actually happened recently enough that I remember it. And also it happened, it, it was it turned out to be interesting enough that I jotted down notes to remind myself so I could write it up at some point because um, it, oh, wow. it was fascinating. But so the situation is I was working in a uh, view application uh, using Nuxt.js and I have a number of third party things that I'm using. I was using uh, view select, uh, which is kind of a combo uh, type ahead selector thing. Super cool little plugin. Um, and I had just updated it to the latest version and I noticed that it was not working right. Um, it was not automatically filtering down options as I did the type ahead. And I thought, is that a bug in the latest version? What's going on? So I pulled down the, the latest version repo and kind of did ran through tests and the exact same thing was working fine when I just looked at the repo itself. And then I thought, okay, so this is weird. Let me see, like, am I using it wrong? Um, and couldn't find it. Um, so, and then I, so I started digging more and more and more. Um, I went back to the previous version, discovered actually the previous version. Um, uh, I don't think it was working quite right either. I'm not actually, I don't remember that. So ignore that, but I, it wasn't working. Um, and I saw that there was an odd warning message in the console. Um, and I don't, I didn't jot that down. I should actually go back and get that for when I write this up, but it was something about, you know, warning, you can't redefine or you're, you're redefining this thing as a method, it was already a prop. And it was a, a the, the warning was kind of from down inside of this third party library. And I thought, okay, that's kind of weird. Let me dig through the source code of that library. Like maybe I'm using it in a weird way. Um, couldn't find it. It was only, that thing was there as a prop. There were no other references to the, anything of that name. I had no idea what could be causing this. And it's not even, it's not in my code, right? So it's like, what what did I do here? Um, the way I ended up eventually tracing it down is I uh, put a breakpoint in the view warn code so that the, because uh, by the time I was, I wasn't getting a bit backtrace really except through view warn. So I would go into view warn, I put a breakpoint there. And then when I uh, ran it again, that let me look at the definitions that were coming in. And I saw, okay, this, thing is getting a a method with this name and there was a pointer back to the source file where that method was being defined and it turned out that method was actually being defined in a separate third party library uh, that was cr be creating essentially a mix in for these view components 
with some method names. And so there was a, and neither, neither library was namespacing. The view selector didn't matter because it was doing its own stuff. Uh, but this third party library was setting up a global method for any component that utilized it that happened to have a naming clash with a property that the view select was using. Oh, uh, no. oh. So long story short, I pulled out the third party library that was defining it. Cause it turned out like I didn't need all of that at all. A collaborator had put it in for like one or two things that it did. So I kind of pulled that out, reproduced the two things that it did, like pulled their code out and just did that piece uh, as my own thing. And that solved the problem and quickly submitted a, you know, an issue on that third party library saying, Hey, if you're going to define these uh, methods in a way that's going to go into any component, you really should namespace them for your library or at least give an <laughs> option to namespace it. Absolutely. That, that must have been so infuriating too, to figure out what it was because it, it's not necessarily something that you did wrong per se. Exactly. Well, and it, it tied a little bit into um, the way that like s some of the sort of application frameworks work. So, if I were just using that uh, library in a single component, it probably wouldn't have been a problem, uh, but it was basically defining a set of common filters. Um, this third party library was like view filters or view filters two or something like that. So it's a set of common filters. And so I just put it in the sort of global plugin space where it gets included in every component <laughs> because we were using it all over the app. But that means that it's not only getting included in my own components, it's getting included in every third party component everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, that was my recent really tricky bug and it was a pain. But things I learned was you can put breakpoints anywhere. And if you're getting <laughs> warnings like, Vue is Vue as a framework. Um, I've been using Vue a lot. I haven't. I think React was good at this too, but it's been almost a year since I used React extensively. Um, but Vue gives you lots of different informative warnings, and if you put a breakpoint in at those warnings, then you can actually get a lot of rich information about what's triggering that that isn't there in the the direct backtrace of the warning because you can look at you can get lots of context of where are the objects that are getting passed in that are resulting in this what files are they coming from all that stuff so breakpoints are awesome yeah that's really handy that's a helpful tip yeah and i'm so glad you made it out of battling that bug alive cable <laughs> to join us here today <laughs> yeah it felt it felt actually like i was angry a little bit but it also felt really good to solve it because it was like wow that's a tricky yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that catharsis and satisfaction and endorphin rush you get after fixing a bug that's so good. There's this sort of like I can move on with my life feeling as well, I think. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just decluttered. Well, and <laughs> the nice thing actually about it being a combo of third party things is you don't have this the reaction of like, how could I have been so stupid? Right. Because it's yes. not like I introduced this by doing something really stupid and then I spent all this time debugging. It's like, no, this was a really interesting combination of things that were mostly outside of my control, certainly outside of my expectation. And yet we tracked it down so that, you know, it, it has a nice feeling for that. Yeah. Love yeah. blaming someone else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can share one of mine, although it, it is it just happens to be JavaScript, but this could happen in a lot of different languages. Oh, that's great. Um, I was writing a JavaScript driver for a specific piece of hardware. And so like, yes, it sues. I'm going to talk about hardware. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I had a small display that you can plug into Arduino microcontrollers um, in order to be able to display things like you can write text, you can write pictures to it. It's essentially just... Um, a monochromatic screen that has like pixels that light up or they don't light up. So it, there's only really two kind of states that you can have. And the way that you um, drive these screens specifically is that you encode all of the pixels just into straight up bytes, right? So one bit is a pixel. And so if the bit is, um, has the value zero, then it's basically like the pixel is dark. And if you have it as a one, the pixel is actually lit up on the screen. And so that seems very straightforward. Um, and so when I read the data sheet, I was like, cool, I've got this. I understand how to do this. And I hadn't really done a lot of bitwise manipulation in JavaScript before. So I really did learn a lot about it in this particular um, project that I was working on. But I would 
what I would end up doing is I would um, import a like a bitmap and then I would use bitwise operations to basically take that bitmap and convert it into, um, you know, a monochromatic one using, you know, whatever algorithm you want to use for that. In this case, it was Floyd Steinberg, but that's not relevant. And then I would then have to just take like basically a frame buffer that was full of empty bytes and start sort of like using bitwise operations to shift in all of the different pixel values that I needed. And I was like, yeah, this is just a linear thing, right? It's like the first byte is going to be the first eight pixels of the picture. And then it's just going to go from left to right. And then when it gets to the next row of the actual picture, it'll just like, you know, keep sort of going left to right and then back again. I was like, this is very straightforward. So every time I sent the frame buffer that I was preparing with JavaScript, you know, bitwise operations, every time I sent it, the picture would just not be that. I think I was trying to send a picture of a parrot and it would just be complete garbled nonsense on the screen. And I was very frustrated because this is a very hard thing to debug. And I think even in JavaScript, doing bitwise operations, yes, you can spit out the final value of the byte and things like that, but it's harder you you have to do a lot of mental math to then convert it back into the actual bit representation like if you have like a byte that's like 2c or something unless you sort of have this stuff memorized and you're very good at kind of like hexadecimal math and stuff it's hard to figure out okay well is that like 01101 or like trying to figure that out and so that's something that I don't think is particularly, um, I guess, intuitive, at least in JavaScript. You kind of almost have to come up with your own little tools in order to debug that. And so the problem ended up being was, um, just to cut the story short, was I wasn't reading the data sheet correctly. And it turns out that each byte is actually like a column of eight pixels going down. So oh, you no. have to, yeah, so you have to imagine it in that every time, you know, the first byte in this frame buffer array is actually just painting straight downwards, you know, starting from the first, um, the most, uh, the most significant bit is like kind of X zero, Y zero. And then the next bit in that byte is like, x0 y1 for example and it keeps going down and then once you've satisfied that column you move across one uh, on the x axis and then you start painting downwards again and i just the data sheet was actually very explicitly clear but i just skipped over that section as you do you're like yeah i got this and so it was very frustrating because what i really should have done was i should have written a tool that was able to preview this stuff more on the client side because when you send this stuff to hardware it is enormously difficult to debug. You're just like, well, it's not doing what I want it to. And I don't really have any feedback from that. And so what I learned was one, read the data sheet properly, but two, sometimes it's worth slowing down and spending maybe 15 minutes writing something that emulates the screen, for example, or emulates it in a way where you would expect it to, to show it certain, you know, order of pixels, for example. To be honest, I would have debugged it a lot faster because I would have been able to verify that at least my initial assumption about the order of pixels, at least that I was dumping it out in the correct way. And so therefore it couldn't have been that. And so I did lose a lot of time debugging what was my initial assumption about what the order of pixels should be in the first place. So again, not very related to JavaScript, but kind of showing that I had a limited tool set to debug with. And so that's what made it so annoying. Well, that also gets back to this question of validating assumptions, right? Which is, yeah, not limited to JavaScript, but so key. Absolutely. How do I even check what my assumptions are and then test them? Yes. And so I never forgot it too. I kind of did what you did, Cable, and I took copious notes about it so that I didn't ever go back to that other assumption. And then I ended up writing a blog post about like how all led screens work and so to be honest i've actually referenced that blog post personally myself probably more than anyone else has so it's been like really really good to write up that's the amazing thing about blogging uh is like yeah i search for my own blog posts all the time because I'm like, <laughs> i know i figured this out already how the heck did it work it's so true it's so so true all right nick do you want to share your own harrowing bug story sure uh as Kevin said, or Cabal said, it's um, kind of faded in my mind a little bit. So I'm trying to recollect myself as best I can because I've I've tried for so long to block it out. Uh, but okay. I often <laughs> I often Whatever get you need to heal. Yeah, <laughs> this is therapy. Uh, <laughs> I often get um, tasks 
uh, through my job to like come in on a project and figure out like a very specific bug. Uh, and then that's it. And, um, so this is one of those times where a, uh, a client sent us their code and said, we're having this bug. We can't figure it out and it works fine in local development. And so, uh, I was running their code locally. It's an angular project, uh, angular four, I think. And, um, I, I tried to reproduce it and I could not reproduce it except for when I used Chrome's um, emulate 3G uh, in the network tab to emulate a slow network connection, then I could reproduce it every time. Uh, but the problem was they had this table on the page uh, that had expandable rows. And when they the rows expanded, they would introduce a link in there. And when you click the link, it would use Angular routing to navigate to another page. And then the contents of that page would not be fully filled out. You would just see like a small portion of it unless you resized the window or um, did any kind of interaction with the page, like a click, then everything would just oh. pop into place. And so just a terrible bug because you have to do it only on a 3G, emulating 3G, which slowed everything down because there's a lot of stuff in development that was being downloaded. And um, I immediately started looking at the the router thinking, oh, this is a problem with, with routing for some reason. Uh, but it was actually not part of that at all. The, the table that they were using on the previous page was um, NG Grid or AG Grid, I think. Um, which is a, like a grid project uh, specifically for Angular projects. And that has some code in there that I, I ended up debugging down and figuring out that um, when the rows were being expanded, that was causing the problem. So if I just had the link on the page and clicked the link, then everything worked fine. So it had something to do with the rows being expanded in there. And I was trying to figure out what that was. And it's really tough. Um, and this was also kind of a, a really big deep dive into Angular for me. And so trying to understand that and and what it was actually doing, I had no idea how Angular was, was working internally. And um, Angular relies on this project called Zone.js to um, listen to and uh, update itself when asynchronous tasks happen, things like set timeouts or uh, promises being resolved. And it uses that to trigger its uh, diffing to understand when it needs to re-render portions of the page. And digging through the Angular code and then the Zone.js code and then back up to the AG grid code and trying to figure out what was the problem in there, uh, there, there was a method in AG Grid, where when those rows were being updated, it was actually calling a zone.js method called run outside Angular, which means do this asynchronous action that was wrapped in a set timeout, um, but do it outside of Angular's change detection so that Angular won't actually do any kind of updating on that. And so the way that the, the nature of what they were doing with adding in new rows, it was being added in in a way where it wasn't fully flushing out the all of the the changes that it needed to from the the change detection um, buffers that that Angular was using, and so when I'd go to the next page, there were still things that hadn't been cleared out of that, and so triggering like a click or resizing the window would actually cause the change detection to run again, see that it had changes, oh. and then update the page. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. It was, it was very traumatic, very, very terrible. But uh, <laughs> what ended up happening, I, I was going through trying to figure out, you know, if I just remove this run outside Angular and get it to run normally, then everything works. Um, but what I ended up recommending <clears throat> to the client is instead of just triggering an on change callback like they were doing for when the, the rows were getting reset, actually recalculate the rows, which would force Angular to realize that it had uh, changes that needed to be applied to the DOM and then do that. And then everything worked okay. But it took like a week of going back every couple of hours and saying, this is what I found. Uh, and, you know, I can investigate this further. I need more time, et cetera. Uh, but just a week of back and forth on that. And it was, it was not fun, but uh, I learned a lot. And I think that the big takeaway is asynchronous bugs are very hard, especially if they're not easily rep reproducible uh, locally. And uh, I just don't like the idea of overriding things like set timeout and promises to to do change detection. Yeah, that's really scary. So one of the commonalities that I've kind of seen in all of your stories is it's all about having to kind of explore a breadth of code to debug a single issue, whether you're having to like 
dive into third party code um, or just read through a lot of invocations. Like it's really just like processing a lot of information to try and find the one thing that's causing the problem. Yeah, there's a lot of like just kind of trying to build up a picture of what the heck is going on. Um, our our friend Bobby Tables, uh, David Poindexter points out in the Slack that you know if you can figure out a reduced test case, it's super valuable. Um, that I think Suze, you mentioned that a little bit. Um, you know, what that lets you do if you can do it is really isolate that space of where you're trying to get the picture of like what the heck is going on here. Um, you can't always do it. I think in that async example um, that you're giving, Nick, just trying to do an isolated case might have like, you know, you're trying to run it outside of Angular and it worked or whatever. Like that sort of points you in the right direction for where the heck do I look for this? But um, yeah, it's it's really like there's not a science to this. It's like we're just trying to f- to create a map in our head of what the heck is happening. Totally. Yeah. And I'm really stubborn too. And I'm too lazy. I'm like, no, I'm going to waste more time writing this test case. I bet you I'm just like right on the brink of figuring this out. And so I will just cycle endlessly rather than slow down and actually kind of explore and write verification for it. And that's something that I'm trying to work on as a developer in general constantly. It's like, don't, don't think that this is a waste of time because it's probably going to end up saving you more time in the long run. If you just slow down and write something that will be able to either reproduce it in another case or like what Nick did, I'm going to like actually go off and try and like look at how it behaves in this context. I'm really glad you mentioned that Suze, because uh, I do that too. And it's just good to, to know that, that uh, others do as well. Like think that, (laughs) Oh, I, I'm too lazy. I don't want to do this like, like, I don't want to put in all of this work because I'm right on the, the edge. I always feel like that. And it, I always come out worse at the end, uh, I feel. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that I'm not the only one as well. So I'm very glad that I shared it. Those are some really interesting stories for our second segment. We've been talking a lot about bugs and we've talked a little bit about ways to avoid them or tips and tricks to keep in mind when trying to solve them. Uh, In the next segment, when we come back, we're going to provide you with some tools and techniques to reduce the number of bugs in your code or help debug bugs. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Vettery, a hiring marketplace that connects job seekers and tech with the hiring managers from top companies in the U.S. And I had a chance to talk with Brian Levy, VP of product, about one of the most memorable and impactful things about the job seekers experience on Vettery. Every candidate on Vettery gets assigned their very own talent executive who guides them every step of the way. The talent executives is an internal team that works with candidates as they're coming on the platform, helps them fill out their preferences. We get on the phone with job seekers and talk through their backgrounds and what they're looking for in their career. And then once job seekers are on the platform, we help them look into roles and companies that they're interviewing with and talk through offers that they get on the platform in order to make sure that they get tailored offers that meet their requirements and their career goals. It sounds like you're holding a candidate's hand through the whole process. Yeah, definitely working with a talent executive is essentially having a personal career coach who can help you think through how does a job relate to your career goals like what should I be asking for in an offer what should I be doing to prepare for an interview Uh, essentially what a career coach would do so it's often a very isolating experience Vettery has found a way to ensure that job seekers aren't alone in the process yeah that's exactly right and I think that it's really something that we hear a lot from job seekers on Vettery is that working with a talent executive is often the thing that is most memorable and most impactful about their experience experience on Vettery is that they have someone to bounce ideas off of who can help them think through their career goals and decide, is this the right company for me? And um, if it is, how am I going to land this job? All right. Take that first step. Head to Vettery.com slash changelog to learn more and get started. Also, our listeners get a $500 signing bonus when you find your job through Vettery. Once again, that's Vettery, V-E-T-T-E-R-Y.com slash changelog. 
and by DigitalOcean, the simplest cloud platform for developers and teams. Deploy, manage, scale faster and more efficiently on DigitalOcean. Managing infrastructure is easy for teams, whether you're running one virtual machine or thousands. Use our special link to get $100 credit for DigitalOcean and try it today for free. Head to do.co slash changelog. Once again, do.co slash changelog. We are back for the last segment of this recording. Uh, we are going to be giving you the answers to life, the universe, and everything. Not really. We're just <laughs> going to be helping you reduce the number of bugs in your code, uh, sharing some tools and some programming principles to keep in mind. Uh, so does anyone want to share some things? Uh, we've mentioned a few already on the podcast, but anything new you want to share on how you avoid those pesky bugs? There's no way to avoid them. <laughs> TypeScript was a big one. I feel like we were gonna we were gonna talk about TypeScript, but we've got there already. But I mean, TypeScript is going to solve a very very specific problem for you, right? Um, but there are outside of things like type errors and just like the really cool linting that um, Visual Studio Code can do. Are there any other, um, I guess, like plugins for IDEs? Um, you know, while we're on the topic, that anyone's really really liked using, other than what we've already talked about. I mean, I'm a hardcore Vim addict, so I don't, I don't really do those IDE things. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Uh, and one plugin that comes to mind is Ale, or the asynchronous linting engine, uh, which is great. It, uh, it basically makes Vim uh, yell at you like other editors would. So it'll uh, give you a gutter on the, the left side of your code. And if, as you're typing, if you, it checks things like uh, your ESLint RC file or your TSLint or... Um, talks to the TypeScript server if you're using TypeScript, and it will give you information about that line and then put down in the the little error um, message area at the bottom of the screen what the problem is. So if you're uh, trailing comma or whatever, it'll it'll tell you that right there. But it also has a, a really nice feature called Ale Fix, which will do things like run your prettier config and automatically update the file. That's cool. Wait, is this for Vim or another editor? For Vim. Heck yeah, I use Vim, so I'm going to install this now. Thank you. I learned that today. We really do need a Vim party because like, it seems like just about everybody on here is all about it. Oh boy. I used to be all about it, but then when I started uh, working full time, everyone at the company uses VS Code. So now I'm on the VS Code train, which actually I quite like it. But unfortunately, I don't have any uh, new extensions to mention besides like TSLint. So in terms of practices, uh, David in the Slack channel brought up something that I was going to, which is uh, immutability and mm. trying not to mutate state. Um, I think you know, so many of the bugs that we run into, you know, not just are like, so at one layer, we could say these are about types and undefined, but at another layer, it's just about this thing has changed from what we expect it to be. Um, and it's way harder to reason about that sort of what we expect it to be and keeping it um, there if you're mutating state as you go along. Um, and so the more you can write your code in a way that where you're const you're always creating uh, new objects and you're you're being immutable and you have functions that are pure and that are not creating all these side effects, the more it becomes easy to reason about what's going on, the more it becomes easy to test and you have a lot fewer challenges with bugs. And you can do that in a way where even if you are dealing with something that is fundamentally uh, mutation oriented, um, like I'm thinking about, you know, one of the big contrasts between the way that Vue and Vuex handles state and the way that React and Redux handle state is that uh, Vue leans very heavily into this concept of reactivity and you have data that you mutate and things react from that. Um, but if you kind of isolate that reactive piece, uh, and so you're still doing, you know, all of your changes are based on, I'm going to take something, I'm going to uh, immutably come up with a new state, and then at that point, I'm going to do my assignment so that my sort of mutable store changes at that point. Uh, but all of your logic and, and communication and thinking about is essentially treating these things as immutable. 
Um, it just becomes so much easier to reason about the flows of data and you don't end up with these objects where you're like, how the heck did that end up that way? It's so true. And it also does mean that it's it's provides the opportunity for you to have really cool debugging things like the time travel debugging and things like that, where you can actually start capturing that data every time you generate a new copy of it. That's like basically like a little record in time. And that ends up opening the doors to like all sorts of really cool stuff where you can actually watch something live and you can actually capture that even from user data so that you can actually see exactly what they were doing at that given time. And you can reproduce the state of your app as well. So I think that by itself is really good. And then also what it opens up for debugging itself is kind of amazing. Has anyone seen Code Lauren by Mary Rose Cook? I have not. It's a really cool example of this. It's it's basically an old project. I don't think that they work on it anymore, but it's for it's like game programming for beginners. And they designed the, um, it's basically a web-based IDE and I think it's codelauren.com. And they designed it in a way where you can draw shapes and, and compare things and um, you can specify functions and data types and stuff like that. But also you can step backwards and forwards through the program as you're actually writing it as well. And I think that that's really, really cool to be able to learn how that approach to things like immutability and avoiding side effects and things like that could be really, really helpful. I had two uh, sort of programming principles that I wanted to share for helping uh, reduce the number of bugs. Uh, one of them is just something that I always do and that I am trying to do less of, which is having numerous cases in a single if statement. Um, so, you know, I might be like saying if this combination of cases or this combination of cases, but not that combination of cases, then do this. <laughs> um, and that's just like definitely asking to shoot myself in the foot later, um, but just kind of like being deliberate about how you're implementing uh, logic in my code. Um, is something that helps me reduce the number of bugs in it. Um, and then another one, which I learned really recently, is to avoid uh, Boolean traps. Boolean traps are cases where you essentially pass a Boolean parameter to a function. Um, and usually what your intention is there is to treat a Boolean flag or a parameter as some sort of flag um, that internally your function may or may not do one thing depending on what the value of the Boolean is. Um, you end up shooting your foot, especially in JavaScript, because uh, there isn't like a way to do named parameters in JavaScript besides like the trick of passing an object to a function instead of a list of parameters. Um, and so what ends up happening is you pass a Boolean to a function expecting it to do one thing, but that logic is obfuscated from you and that Boolean flag doesn't actually do what you intend. Um, and it sort of just follows a general programming principle of um, don't have functions that take Booleans to um, dictate what internal logic happens. Um, so yeah, those are like two tips, especially around Booleans. I feel like those Booleans are one of the subtler places where um, bugs can happen um, in code. And those are some things I try and do to reduce them. I'm glad that Booleans are brought up because they really are like not talked about as much as type errors and side effects and things like that. And mm -hmm. it is it is bewildering when you are trying to use a library for the first time. And <laughs> I'm guilty of this, actually, because one of the first libraries I ever wrote um, for like other people to consume was that one for the screen. And I have I am breaking the rule that we're talking about right now where I am asking for arbitrary like booleans to be passed in to the function as an argument. And that does tend to be where it's very, very hard for other people who are also using the code you've written in Teams to reason about those kind of things as well. And I think that also with booleans, one thing that I've gotten better at with time is just explicitly um, naming them properly and using naming conventions for them as well. And so you've probably seen these recommendations on the internet a fair bit where, um, you know, you can have a boolean that is that can be named with like is, has, and should, and things like that at the beginning, which makes it so much more clear what it is. So instead of calling a Boolean, for example, something, or um, I guess we can come up with a better example, such as um, 
hide versus is hidden. Yes. Hi- yes. Mm. Thank you. That is perfect. Yeah. So should hide or is hidden or um, something like that is better than just the word hide or hidden or something, you know, if hidden um, is not as clear as um, is currently hidden or something like that. And I think that that's really good to be a little more explicit in your bullion so that people understand exactly what you're intended to do with them because they are such a simple primitive. It's like a true or a false. And so, you know, there's not much you can extrapolate from there unless you name it properly. Yeah. Naming is huge. And I think sort of associated with that is just being extremely explicit, valuing explicitness over terseness. I think, uh, it's really easy to get sucked into how sexy metaprogramming is and how like, oh, I can have so much power. I can do all these things and I can write this, you know, really reusable code that does everything. Um, But code is read way more often than it is written. And it is also, you know, the, the difference between writing one function and four or five functions is rarely that big in terms of time. But by being much more explicit you can really cut down on your bugs around like oh i didn't think about that case or or that sort of thing like i feel like uh i followed this trajectory that i think a, a lot of developers can probably resonate with where you know i started out and i didn't know much what i was doing and i just was happy to get it done and then i learned about metaprogram and i was like oh this is amazing i'm going to create these perfect systems they're going to be so cool and doing all those <laughs> you know fancy metaprogramming things and you end up ended up in all these nightmare corner cases and debugging and how the heck did this and how did how do I do that and whatever and sort of went back to well yeah metaprogramming is a pretty useful tool occasionally but for the vast majority of cases I'm going to just be explicit and just do the thing <laughs> I have touched metaprogramming code bases before where other people wrote the metaprogramming and I just think that that is also an area where it can get so subjective on how it's written depending on who wrote it and that's actually been one of the more difficult things for me as well. And I think that that's pretty much what you summarized right there. Yeah. I think one of the great summary summary points that I I take back from the conversation we just had is if you write code that's easy to read, you're going to write code that's easy to debug and code that is also less likely to have bugs. So kind of the root thing you're going for is always readability and accessibility. Totally. Also write, less code you know if there's a css feature that does what you want then use css and and use uh, let me go even more on that use less powerful code the more that you can so metaprogramming kind of fits into that but even more like if you can do this thing in markup or in css instead of javascript do it in markup or css like code that you don't write doesn't have bugs (laughs) that's quite true That's actually the the real solution. Just don't write code. <laughs> don't write any code. Yeah, get out of the get out of the industry. No code required. Um, but I mean, if we do it, you could take it in a number of dimensions, right? So like, there's use the least powerful tool possible to get what you want. Uh, there's use uh, well used, well validated frameworks and libraries. Things where somebody else has probably already worked through this, and you you know this isn't like use this random package that I found on GitHub that you know, five people are using, this is like, okay, there's a reason why, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are using this library or this framework. It's got a lot of testing. It's got a lot of other things. Like let's mostly use that rather than reinventing the wheel. All right. Those are some really useful tips. We are coming close to the end of the hour on here. Hopefully you all had a wonderful time listening to us and you learned something new about interesting cases where bugs can come up and also how you can avoid those bugs in the first place. Uh, Thanks for joining us here on the JS party, the best party of all. Um, Thank you to everyone joining me today, Kval, Nick, Susie, and we shall see you next time. All right, thank you for tuning in to JS party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor, share this show with a friend, or just an Apple podcast, go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at Change Law because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash Change Law. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.